Well, hey, everybody. Joe here, Small Town Failing Podcast. Welcome to a very special Reunited, and it feels so good, episode <laughs> of the show. Um, it does feel good. It does. <laughs> like old times. That's right. Here's the word of the day. Um, <laughs> starting that voice you hear, you might recognize if um, you're one of the like 95% of listeners that knew me from Bloody Good Horror is one Mr. Eric Newell from the Bloody Good Horror podcast and website and all around things. It is hey, me. Hey, Eric. How are we doing? <laughs> I'm the problem. It's me. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm glad. I'm very glad to be here. That music is delightful. You'll be shocked to find that was royalty free. Um, just out <laughs> I, there. <laughs> it's got like, uh, you know, uh, 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 like I forgot his name. It's very like 70s singer songwriter like like cat stevens james taylor uh, and that's what i was james taylor jim croce i think i was going for yeah that whole thing uh couldn't tell you who made it but uh, you know youtube like automatically puts it in i don't know how they know like oh really the title (laughs) yeah it's terrifying um but eric so for people that don't know eric is uh the host founder creator of uh bloody good horror which is a weekly podcast where they discuss horror movies um new releases older stuff uh, kind of three core hosts, a rotating guest usually. I, for about 12 years, was one of those hosts as well. Um, and then, you know, we had a big blow up and, and just hard <laughs> ways. <laughs> and, uh, but it, maybe, but you know. <laughs> full on fist fight. Um, if you've ever no, watched I mean, the. We legitimately uh, just spoke in real life for the first time since 2020, yeah. like since the last podcast we were on. I don't want to say it mirrored the Motley Crew behind the music, but it was <laughs> as close as you can get. Um, nice. I, as I was saying yeah. to you before the show, yeah, I, I truly understand behind the music now. Right? Because when you do something with somebody for a long time, it just shit gets hard. Yeah. I mean, the only difference, I just let my sex tape get out there and, you know, well, I'm proud. <laughs> I was in great shape when it was filmed. Uh, Captured but, your youth. <laughs> but Eric, so thank you for coming on, uh, obviously. Hallmark movies and the ilk, the, I should say the movie we're doing this week and we'll kind of get to why is the secret ingredient 2020, uh, Hallmark movie Valentine's (laughs) Valentine's day themed. And you know, that's not the specific reason, but what is your kind of history with Hallmark movies? I think we've talked, this is the first one you've ever sat down and watched, but so, uh, I have two two things that kind of prepare me for this a little bit. It's not mm-hmm. very much, but my mother was like, was and is the original Hallmark movie audience. Yeah. Like before they became a kind of meme or like a sort of ironically comfortable, like like warm bath kind of thing that people enjoyed. She was the mom who in the nineties had the this like lifetime on we'll all day while yep. she was cooking or whatever, you know, like, so I definitely that I'm familiar with sort of that vibe. And then I watched involuntarily with my ex-wife, the Christmas Prince Mm -hmm. uh, in 2020, I think. And that was like the one I remember where suddenly like everybody was talking about these movies. Like, you know, it was a pandemic. It was like uh, Tiger King and like whatever, whatever thing to distract us from the horrors of life and life day. out there. Yeah. Yeah. And I remember that movie being just like painful, just well, that, painful to watch. That's the one. Yeah. I, I remember it getting a lot of attention uh, because of like, if I remember right, the opening scene, which every one of these usually has like just B roll shots of like the city or town or wherever it's totally. taking place. That one I think was supposed to take place in New York, but then there was random shots that were Chicago. Like it was just off the bat. It was like, what the fuck are we doing here? But it was, a ne- I don't believe it was actually Hallmark. It was like one of those Netflix ones that was as the Hallmark movies Netflix, were good. Getting- yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, you, I assume you do oh, yeah. whatever, as long as it falls under the general umbrella, even like the lifetime, like stabby movies, like CC has been on a handful of episodes and we usually do something like that. Like, it's just, you know, kind of the, the lifetime Hallmark sort of genres. Um, So I'm not that familiar. So you're going to get like a very pure review, not only of the movie, but just like of these movies in general, because I just found this whole thing fascinating. Yeah. It's, it's interesting because I, similar to you um, and a lot of people, uh, I, when we talk about the horrors of life, 
our horror of life that got Leslie and I to start watching these was our second daughter being born. And I've, t- I've talked about this a lot on the show, but like we'd be up at like 3 a.m. doing like the night feeding. And it was just like, you're not going to turn on the news because it's awful. Like we would just turn yeah. on Hallmark Channel and just my like, second daughter gave me a reflux when she's <laughs> exactly. I still have it. The gift that keeps on giving. Um, and then when the pandemic hit, like, yeah, just full on dove in and, and stuck with it. So I do generally love these movies. And I think I've kind of touted on this show that, especially in the last few years, the sort of format, especially what your mom is probably used to of like returning home to small town. Oh, there's your ex. You immediately leave your, you know, fiance in New York City. Like the, the stereotypical, oh, there's only one script they've definitely kind of broken away from, and we've talked a lot about on the show. Unfortunately, this one, not the case for you. Very, like this yeah, is, yeah. <laughs> this is, I was sure. watching this last night. That's knowing good, Maybe that's good because I'm not that familiar. So this is a good like entree into like the basics. That's, it's, that's a valid point. Like I was watching this last night and thinking like, oh, this is, uh, this is one. <laughs> this is definitely. Um, I was texting you in the middle of it yesterday. <laughs> so the re- so the the backstory or the reason why I thought this would be a fun one. One, it's Valentine's Day theme, so you know we're in the thick of February, so it makes sense. But the director, which I've kind of discovered doing this show, a lot of horror and like Hallmark and Lifetime, there's a lot of crossover. Like it seems yeah. like a lot of directors that get into just doing like one after another in the last like four or five years have roots in doing like horror in like the early nineties and like mid nineties, whether it's like, that well, kind of makes stuff, sense or because yeah. these feel like the kind of movies you would do if you were like a real workman director, like you're, you know what I mean? Like this is yeah. not a passion project. This is like day work. It's a good paycheck. And I would imagine some of those shitty horror movies were similar. Yeah. In the early and 90s. I've got it like, especially in the last few years, like, the, the you viewing the audience of these the secret ingredient you know what I you're mean? kind you're of following the script right and the budgets for these have gotten better so i've got to imagine like some of the horror movies we've watched are just you know god knows what they were making on that but i'm sure they're all just like renting an rv and living in it while they were shooting right versus these like the conditions have got to be a lot better you're in like vancouver I bet it's a cushy gig yeah exactly yeah. um you're and- not shooting action Right. You're like, I'm going to shoot 20 conversations today and just sit in my chair. You're going to like hang out in a small (laughs) town and go to like the craft services. Yeah. Um, Even literally uh, a few episodes uh, ago, we did one that actually was filmed in the town over from us. And it is like, literally, it looks like one of these movies. And yeah. If I was going to get paid to like hang out there for three weeks and just go to the coffee shop every morning, like, hell yeah. Like mine as well. Um, But anyway, getting back to the point, Tabor. Takak, I have no idea how to say this guy's name. Nanny, yeah. Tabor Takax, uh, we'll, we'll just go with that, is the director of this. And he directed The Gate from the, Gate. Uh, the early to mid 1980s. Seven, I think. And the reason that kind of stuck out to me is Bloody Good Horror, even before I was on the show, one of the funniest stories that we got from a listener was that he went to, it was, it was a yard sale. Oh, so, yeah. So we get an email from like a grandmother. Mm -hmm. And she says, my grandson was at a garage sale and they told him that this gate, this fence gate that they had was from the movie, the gate. And so he bought it. Can you, cause she must've just Googled horror and found us, which thank God for that, our analytics there. But like, it was like, can you confirm this? And so we read it and I hadn't even like thought about it because I, I got the emails and I read it and didn't mm-hmm. think twice about it. And you or somebody else was like, wait a second. There's no gate in the movie. There's the no, gate. It's like, just it's a, a hole. It's a theoretical <laughs> gate. It's a conceptual gate to hell. Like, And we just fucking <laughs> lost our... like The fact that this old lady was like emailing us, that somebody made up this elaborate story about the gate to sell a fence gate to someone mm-hmm. like... Oh man. Yeah. That was but to a... to someone that's never seen the movie. Like you're <laughs> somehow you're trying to like convince someone to buy this prop from a movie that didn't <laughs> so exist. Funny. I mean, if I remember right, there's one point where they put like some wood planks over the hole in the ground to like try it. So maybe yeah, that was it. Wood. Like, yeah. 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 Which I, I mean, it's funny. The gate is one of the first movies I remember ever renting on pay-per-view like back when you had to like call and like actually request it. Um, I had no idea there was a part two which he oh. also directed, which I've never seen, but 
Ooh, that'll be it, a fun one. It's actually because uh, I watched the trailer as we, I was kind of poking around and setting up for today. It's got the uh, best friend from the first one, and then the female lead is. Isn't that um, always the sequel thing? It's like we couldn't get the lead back, so here's the nerdy best uh, friend, and now yeah. we're gonna ask him to carry the whole movie. The <laughs> and I forget a name off the top of my head, but the uh, oh, I've got it in front of me. The uh, the sequel, Pamela Adlon, who you probably don't recognize the name, but if you ever watched that show, um, Louis or Life with Louis. I or remember uh, Californication. She was the uh, the wife on the old HBO Louis show, or she was on California Cage. If you saw her picture, you'd know exactly who she is. Mm-hmm. Like thick Brooklyn accent or Boston, maybe like, uh, but it's got her when she was like probably 15 or something. Um, anywho, The Secret Ingredient 2020, directed by Tabor. We'll just stick with that. Uh, stars Aaron McKill and Brendan Penny, who have been in nine million Hallmark movies. Okay, so you're you've seen some of these people. Oh yeah, for sure. Like there's we gotta talk about this guy because he is a fucking black hole of personality. <laughs> he sucks so bad. It's interesting because I have seen. You know, he is definitely he's been a lot. I don't need to interrupt you immediately, but I just no, have- <laughs> please. Like if. You know, the show is literally, we'll probably talk about the movie for like 10 minutes and then just. She's great. Like, she's, she's charismatic and she's acting. She's yeah. doing the thing. He, the two of them have no chemistry because he just is like, I cannot imagine what it's like having a conversation with this dude. And it's weird because I have seen some of his others and never really gotten like this take from him. Like it's. Did you feel that too here? I was like. A hundred percent. Oh, honey, you're so pretty. You've never had to have a personality. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that is. Um, so the setup of this is Kelly is a bakery owner in North Carolina, I think they say. And she, you know, loves her little shop. She has a really good business going. Apparently she's doing like online sales, this whole thing. Finds out that her ex-fiance, Andrew, who is played by um, Brendan, is coming back home and we don't really get the setup of why they broke up, but we know that like he just kind of disappeared, which is kind of the thing in a lot of these. I have Um, so much to say about about the way it's dealt with. Yeah. Go for it. Um, I would say the first thing though, that's the synopsis first. (laughs) I mean, that's pretty much it. Like the whole, the, the, so it focuses around, he's coming back home. He's this famous uh, pastry chef living in France. We find out that he left, or he like you know, works for a famous pastry chef. Like he's yeah. always dropping the guy's name. Well, it's so it's this Francois. restaurant. Yeah. Francois is like the head <laughs> chef there. And like, he's his pastry chef and he fancies himself pretty much a Francois where he could do like the whole thing. And I hadn't the, thought about this, but the whole movie is him negging himself about being a pastry chef when that's right? what she does. The, valid. A hundred percent. Just like, her face is like, yeah, whatever. I don't like this. Yeah, I could probably do more. Like, how shitty it is. That is true. I didn't even think about it. Like, (laughs) I'm amazing at this. I'm, you know, like he's so good at he doesn't give a fuck, and that's like her life stream. (laughs) He got like this, and by no means we can spoil this whole thing. Like, there's no, you know, I think the the great thing about these movies versus a lot of the ones we talked about in Bloody Good Horror, like. There's no twist. Like it's no, you know, they're going to end up. You there know, is, but you they're know. the most predictable to like, yeah. you know, it's coming. Yeah. Um, they're going to end up together. I think we can get that out of the way, but we kind of get this. He went to France because he got this opportunity to go to like culinary school and was immediately picked up by Francois for this restaurant and all that stuff. He does make like a snide comment at one point, like, I'm sorry, I got this opportunity or something. And then. What? Right. Okay. So what yeah. you just said, the way you just said that though, is so much more direct and succinct yeah. than the movie <laughs> ever addresses the fact that they were engaged and broke <laughs> up. And like, that's where this movie is so fucking bizarre to me. It's like, again, I'm new to this, right? Yep. So like he comes back into town and it's what they want is this cute. Will they, won't they tension, but they don't want to have, have to do any of the work to actually set it up and so it just he comes back to town and they're right into like oh it's so cute but like they're not a, oh. like they're if there was in a in a real relationship right there would be emotional baggage from, no. from a breakup from moving out of the country from suddenly showing up with no fucking warning no and info she, yep. 
it is never touched on. She has no like agency or thoughts about the fact that he left her. All she does in the whole movie is sit there just giving him doe eyes waiting mm-hmm. for him to just realize he's in love with her again. She never has a, a, a negative thought about the fact that he left. She's mm-hmm. never like you hurt me. She doesn't resist him for a second when he starts flirting with her again. It is so fucking wild. Like the, the way it's so thin and non-existent and like, they just want the tension, the romantic tension. The, the way that, so the setup is she owns this bakery. He's coming back into town unexpectedly and kind of got in touch with his family. His sister comes in and wants, uh, this like her signature cake, which we find out the two of them kind of worked on together before the split up. He's coming back into town and they're throwing him a party. Kelly brings over this cake and sets everything up. And then he walks in, starts eating the cake. And just starts talking to her like nothing has happened. Like to your point, it was one of the most and bizarre sort of like, like reunions. Like because and again, was, you feel yeah. you feel no weight of history between the two of them when like you should Zero. feel the most weight. And so that's like what I was really like. I keep thinking about with this movie and trying to understand these films. There's like this dark <laughs> pathos to these movies, and that is that I understand them as like comfortable junk food Mm -hmm. right because so for some people you get a lot of satisfaction out of that arc of like two people they're they're lovelorn and then they there's tension and then they come together but the irony it's like a it's like a snack food that you can eat a whole bag of and not feel satisfied because Mm -hmm. they're not actually doing the work to create real emotion and so even though you you see the skeleton of the arc and you see it, but it's not satisfying because you don't actually feel it from the characters. And so then you're like, well, cue up another one. Like, let's fucking go again. Well, that's, and that's the, and that's kind of what I was getting to at the top of this. I, it was weird because pick this movie because of the director. And I thought it would be fun as kind of your first entry, but this is not the norm. Like normally there is normally he would come back. They would like bump into each other. It would be awkward. Then they would go their separate ways. Then we would have like two or three more of yeah, those. There would no, be tension. This is like, like nothing ever happened from the moment they see each other. And it's like the first time they've seen each other. What's funny is we were talking about at the top. It would be like if you and I had hopped on this call and I had just hit record and we started. And like there was no like, hey, <laughs> yeah, how's it have, going? Like, we did this for a long time. We could probably could. Yeah. Done, but I understand. Like, it was very, it, it was very strange, sort of the way they reconnected them. And like and so I said, here, it's, so here's the other thing. Yeah. So right out of the gate, right? He, so he comes back into town and the, the setup, I do really appreciate the efficiency of the context that they give you, right? Like mm-hmm. that first, cause it's all commercial breaks. That first commercial break, you have every piece of, before that you have every yep. piece of information you need, but he comes back into town and his mom is throwing him a surprise party. And without telling him, she hires his ex-wife. <laughs> to eat her. Yeah. And everyone's just cool with this. And mom's like, oh, you should just get over it. It was years ago. And I'm like, I would choke my mom. Like, yeah. are you I? Like, you don't even mention this to me. And he's just cool with it. And she's fine with it. And she goes to his house, like, or her house, whatever. Yeah. I was like, that's in, an insane plot point. Just yeah. in its own. But to be fair, based on their reaction, maybe it wasn't a big deal. Like, maybe the mom's like, yeah, they're dead inside. So this will be fine. <laughs> like, there's right. no. They're there's hollow out no. husks of human beings. Yeah. It's fine. Um, so, and then we kind of get to the meat and potatoes of this and it kind of comes out of left field and even watching the trailer, I didn't realize this, but we get this clip of, uh, Kelly watching TV and there's this, um, like iron chef, not iron chef, but like bake off type show that they're all watching. And it's clear that she loves it and all this fun turns out, (laughs) turns out. (laughs) Someone had actually submitted her for their like Valentine's Day competition. So the the idea behind this show is what like four square bakers or something like that. Um, four square cooking. And it's a competition show. It's filmed in New York. The idea is that like people will submit, you know, great chefs and bakers and everything for this show. They'll bring four of them to this competition, but keep them completely separate. 
have them bake separate, judge separately, that so they part never made see me each so other. Fucking angry because there's no logical reason from the point None. of this fictional show to keep them separated, other than that they want this twist, which I don't know if yeah. you mentioned that he's it, also yeah. on the show, exactly. and that leads to this whole meet cute where they run into each other in the city. And we don't realize it at first, but it turns out they're both with producers, but he like yeah. pretends it's his girlfriend or something, right? Pretend. Is that so, what he, I'm to understand? so he comes back into town and says, I'm on my way to New York because my friend is opening a restaurant. His story when they bump into each other is, oh, this is my friend's wife. So it's not his girlfriend, oh, that, it's his friend's okay, wife. Okay, I so, that part. Gotcha. And that's how they get around like, so- the the idea is I love the idea too that somehow all these contestants would have their own personal like personal assistant producers to just follow like them around friend, New York City. Like best they're, they're, friends. Also like, their best friends. <laughs> yeah. So you go and film this in New York. So she gets picked, she finds out, goes to New York also, has her handler slash producer or whatever. They're in separate hotel rooms. They bump into each other walking around New York. And his story is that he's opening this restaurant with his friend. Her story is that she's in town for like some sort of baking conference and like these are our friends, but they start hanging out again. And, you know, the romance is kind of rekindling the first few times the handlers are there with them. But then like and the reason I thought this was weird is because the show makes a big sort of setup of like there's no social media. You can't call anyone. You can't tell anyone you're in New York. Like we need to keep this secret so we can like, you know, keep the show at its purest form where like nobody knows who's on the competition. But these two pretty much start dating and the handlers start trying to get them back together, like to the point where they're way too involved for people that would 100 percent have high pressured New York City jobs and not right? give a fuck about whatever these people were doing. Like like you work in, Those you know, cutthroat. Tell, yeah, like, like yeah. you're constantly running around like I the where I work, I deal with a lot of our production assistants and our production team and like. It's just constant stress. And these like people in reality, are, these people are really mean. And just, you <laughs> know, underwater you with like getting like any fucking weird random request. They're either this mean one, or they're like an inch from having a mental breakdown because they're yeah. so stressed out. Yeah. This one, they're hanging out in the hotel room, like having <laughs> wine, like, you know, going out to dinner. But then and they, put they them up let in, like honeymoon suites, basically. Like they let um Kelly and Andrew go out on dates by themselves. And in my head, I'm like, well, aren't they going to find out? Like, aren't they worried about like Andrew being like, look, I love you again. Here's why I'm actually here. Right, like there's right. so many chances for this to like go south. That's just so get silly. completely thrown out the window. I was um, going to ask you, cause I don't know. Was this, did this look like it was shot in New York city? Uh, some parts, the thing that, and I know they used Vancouver get into it. a lot and yeah, like, yeah, it was filmed up in Canada for sure. Um, the thing that I found funniest was, the city, sure, it, it looks like they're walking around New York. What didn't play was the waiters and stuff. And specifically, oh, they do this scene where both um, production assistants kind of trick them into going to this cheesecake place. And it's the most famous cheesecake in the world and blah, blah, blah. The owner like just starts talking to him like, oh, where are you from? Where's all this? I'm so honored. Finds out that like he's actually been ordering her cake for like years. Oh my God, I rolled my eyes so hard at that, that this random dude in New York City is ordering cakes from this small town bakery that he went to once. Like, Exactly. <laughs> the, the thing that I found funny was like, every restaurant they go to, like the waiters are nice. And like, not that they're not nice in New York, but like, Nobody is stopping and chit chatting and like talking to you for like oh God, fifteen no. minutes about your life. Yeah. They're like, just give me your fucking order. Like, let's like, get oh this over. Oh my God, that's Are my you bakery. Done? Like, shit. yeah, like <laughs> the whole thing was just ridiculous. So, to your question, the city, yes, the people, no, like yeah, just yeah, yeah. no. They were distinctly Canadian, uh, <laughs> <laughs> right? Actually, friendly. <laughs> clearly, clearly Canadian. Um, really so. Funny. So they're going through this competition one by one. They're eliminating these, you know, the other contestants, which they all are like, oh, they eliminated so-and-so. And And like Kelly and Andrew are like, oh, that's the greatest pastry chef in the world. How did I get to stay here? So the funny thing is, and yeah, go ahead. No, no, you go ahead. I was going to say, like, to kind of jump to where this wraps up or, you know, where the competition wraps up. The funny thing is they obviously end up getting to the finals and 
they both end up making the same cake. There's kind of tension there because like Kelly's, you know, this is my cake. I made it. How dare you? You know, Andrew's like, if you remember, like we created this recipe together and like, that's where he makes his little snide comment about like, you know, I left cause I have an opportunity and all that. And then the judges are kind of deadlocked and the host who I actually looked up. She has been a host on some like, uh, really? Food that's network. That's really um, funny. So the host ends up breaking the tie. Kelly ends up winning. And then they read the letter of the person who submitted them and, you know, why they were selected. And it turns out it was actually Andrew's sister, Dawn. And they read this letter about how I want to submit both of them. Normally you send in, like, I would send in, Eric is this amazing chef. I think you should be on the show. Don sends in this letter of like Andrew and Kelly should be on the show. Right. She nominated. They're both amazing. Them. If it gets that like pretty much outs them for their entire failed relationship, like on this <laughs> show. So then in my head, and I kind of want to get your opinion. The first thing that pops in my head is like, Oh, this is rigged. Like they selected oh. them because they wanted this love story. They let them win because there's this love story. Okay, because that does make a lot of sense because that and that would explain why the producers are so like pushing them together. Well, so my thing is like, was that the intention or because it feels very on Hallmark like to have this be a rigged competition? But my I didn't cynical. Pick that, uh, yeah. See, I think it's rigged from the screenwriter's point. <laughs> like, Ex I don't think that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Except that they just because again, it fits with the rest of the script. It fits perfectly with the per. Like that, that came from the person who wrote that the yeah. owner of the restaurant orders cakes from her place. Like, exactly. It's just too perfect, like everything else in the movie. But mm -hmm. I didn't necessarily take it as like being rigged. What I do like about what I did really enjoy about this section is we bring in a lot of more, a lot more actors with this mm -hmm. part. And like, once you get past the leads who, like, again, like, really, just this one lead actress is the only person that seems like she's ever been in a movie. Mm -hmm. But the, when we start, the more actresses are bringing in, it's like, dude, these people look like they are fresh off the bus. Like, mm -hmm. these people look like they've never been in front of a camera before in their lives. Like, the judges, those people yes. are like, this is my big break. I'm this judge. Well, it's because I did started like poking around at some of the ID IMDBs uh, as I was watching this. And a lot of them have been a lot of like small parts in some of these movies. Yeah. What was interesting, the, um, the last chef that gets eliminated before sort of the finale. Um, I don't think I'm overstepping here saying she's, you know, older in years, um, which myself too has only done like four or five things. Uh, and you know, dating back to like the nineties, but like only bounced around a little bit. So I am, I mean, I imagine that's how you make the budgets on these things work is like, you get yeah. a couple legit actors and then you just kind of get your filling in day players kind of. Yep. So it's kind of back to, yeah, I don't think it was the intention of the movie to lead you to believe that this thing was rigged. I just, it was interesting because I was watching it and my cynical brain is like, well, if I was, if this was real and I was watching the show, I'd be like, this is bullshit. Like in, re in real life, it would a hundred percent be rigged. Like yeah. there's no way you're bringing those two people in and not trying to push them to the end. Cause, Cause they that's make your, like, this perfect story. They make this big scene of like the first two or three, I forget how many other people that are eliminated. It's like, Oh, like this person is amazing. Like the greatest in the world. Yeah. So why I'm sure Kelly is wonderful. Uh, I'm sure she, she makes a great cake, but like, come on. Like, what the fuck? Like, you're not going to beat them, <laughs> you know, with your cookie cake for a uh, 50th anniversary. Uh, <laughs> so um, I did really the her acting, the main character actress's acting is so hilarious. Her her I'm on a reality show and I'm trying to beat the clock acting. It was so. Oh, funny. my God. She's yeah. Like, oh, like, oh, like running around and like, oh, man, have you ever seen one of these shows? <laughs> That's that was another thing that kind of stuck out to me um, because I, I don't watch a ton of these, but I've never seen anyone so frantic with like three hours to go, like running and like throwing mixers against the wall, like oh having God, a breakdown. So and they sort of tried to do a little because I have not so much recently, but I used to watch a lot of Top Chef and I, I like Iron Chef, that kind of thing. Yeah, but they um they sort of tried to do when they get to the timing competition part they kind of fake a little reality show edit but mm -hmm. it's so lazy it's so just like we just added in a couple like there's a few more edits in here and a couple snaps yeah something 
but it was so funny, funny too because they would bake these things and then on the shows you watch and like they judge them right there the way that they had to do this to like get like the dates and everything is like she would bake this cake and then they'd leave for like three hours and, and then, which is like they would honestly probably pretty accurate I would go. Oh, it's, that was my like. Do they just leave stuff sitting there? Like, yeah. Well, maybe with me. Yeah, maybe for like a cake, food, sure. But like, yeah, not. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like, you know, what if I decided to make a fudgy the whale for this thing? Well, and I would it's buy just... that they maybe do the tasting and shoot that, take a break, and then come back to do yeah the judging part of it. But yeah, you're right. In here, they don't taste it until after. Yeah, like they take like a two, three hour Which probably break where they make go. Sense. Yeah. <laughs> um, so she ends up winning. Before that, we kind of got this story, and I wasn't quite tracking Andrew's reason for wanting to win. Like, the, we get this other sort of side story where his, um, the chef back in France keeps calling him, and like oh some famous God. reviewer is coming, and like my pastry chef isn't here, and like there's all this drama. He has like a fill in for him that apparently isn't it's working so funny. out it's well. Like, did you approve his vacation or not, man? Like, yeah, like out. were you there? <laughs> um, and he said, and for somebody who like claims to not like this dude, he loves dropping that chef's name like mm-hmm. everywhere he goes, and he tries to demure about it, but he's always like, "I work for Francois." Blah, blah, yeah, blah, blah. well, like he gets like, him into the, this restaurant like, that has like, like, a right, three dude. month wait. Yeah, um, he loves dropping that name. So I get the impression, and I'm not sure if it was super clear that like he wants to win this so he can open his own place and like pretty much get the fuck out of Dodge with Francois. He wants to leave his job, yeah. Yeah. She wants to win because she, you know, you can use the money for stuff. I don't know. Um, Which I thought was interesting that she ended up winning, right? Because it's weird the way they do it. Yeah. What you're expecting is, oh, he wins. She's happy for him, but disappointed she lost. But, oh, he's going to use that money to come back home. Um. Which is what ends up happening anyway, right? Like the the other kind of side story is that she still lives in North Carolina. Her she owns this bakery. Her parents own this restaurant that Andrew and Kelly worked at when they were in high school, and that's how they kind of fell in love. They are deciding to retire and travel and are selling the place. So you kind of start piecing together, like, okay, he's gonna win. He's gonna use that money to buy the place. He doesn't win. So you're like, okay, how is this gonna happen? He still ends up buying the place and he just buys it by using his own right. money He's and like, going bankrupt. Oh, like, I scraped all my money together and it's like, well, what? What was the point here then? Like, <laughs> then what was why the did I just watch this movie? Yeah. Like, <laughs> like you could have just done it. It diffuses the whole point of the entire film almost. A hundred percent. If he could have just done that at any time. So, like, now where things kind of wrap up, they're falling back in love. They've kind of put their differences aside. Everything's beautiful. He's moved back home. You know, he's now going to run this restaurant. She's going to have her bakery across the street. They're going to start pumping out kids. Like, God knows what's about to happen. But that's kind of where things settle. Uh, we get, like, the one year later, everything seems to be going good. Leslie had this comment, and I didn't think of it at the time, but it is kind of interesting. We get the year later. It's Valentine's Day. He proposes, right? Like, I forget. They're like unpacking something, and then all of a sudden he pulls out the ring, and like that's like, how he proposes. Don't eat this Les- one. It's not <laughs> Leslie's Whatever comment was: They dated for I don't know how many years. They were actually engaged, then broke up. Why did you have to wait a year to get engaged again? Like what? <laughs> right. It's not. He's like living a fully a- reset. Yeah, like he's working across the street. Like you guys live probably next to each other. Like what in this past year did you need to like rekindle? I mean, I'll tell you what. I would feel better about seeing them get reengaged if I had heard them had one single real conversation about what happened in their relationship. (laughs) One conversation to cover the basis of what happened. Like that's wild. Like the snide comment of like I had an opportunity and like that was it. And that was the extent. Like, okay, I don't, yeah, that might have been the reason, but there's probably some more emotional baggage that comes along with that. Like, there's got to be. And I would say that is I, I love these movies. My one gripe is when they use the one small misunderstanding is what completely destroys everything. The sitcom. And like, thing, yeah. Yes. And like if it could have been cleared up with just like one sentence, like, oh, my mother was sick, so I had to go back home. And that's why I left, you know, but like 
I don't ever say that. For and the you're first getting nothing from her. Like it's 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 a lot of it's how that how her character is written because like she just demands absolutely nothing from him. She's just like Kelly. Okay, Ke- cool. Kelly, yeah. I think, has some emotional issues. Unfortunately, like I think she needs. <laughs> right. She's a wonderful person, a great pastry chef. Like I think she needs to know her worth. And I, mean, I don't think Andrew is the guy for her. I don't mean to ruin the happy ending, but like I don't think it's gonna work out. <laughs> No, absolutely not. <laughs> this is not going to go well. Like We're Andrew be right has back been over for the sequel in two years. Yeah, Andrew's over in France. You know, he doesn't have much of a personality, but he's a good-looking gentleman. I'm sure he's pulling tail left and right over there. Like <laughs> he's coming back yeah. home. 100%. Andrew's already on Ashley Madison. Like the <laughs> moment that she's back in town, <laughs> that's still on a Tinder. thing. Um, Ashley Madison, that's hilarious. Does that still exist? I don't think so. I don't know. <laughs> we tried to watch, there was like a 2020 or something uh, on like Hulu and we tried to watch it and it was just God awful. About uh, Ashley Madison. Yeah. Yeah. Like just like the history. What a, what a time in society. What? Like I remember, remember when it that leaked. broke? Oh it yeah. That... And it leaked and like one of the Duggars was on there and like. Oh, it was amazing. They released the entire like, like database. List. Yeah. And it was yeah. all dudes. It was like 90 so you, dudes or something. You could go on there and just search for someone's email address and see. Like, I remember the first thing I did was like looked up people on that I know from work and like <laughs> found like three or four people. Like, That's one of the funny. real housewives, her husband was on there. Like, it was amazing. It was an amazing time before like real data breaches started to fuck over our lives. And it was just like fun stuff like that. Like, yeah, before I was in the Anthem leak and had like my social security number leaked to the dark web and like, yeah. Is that exactly. okay? I don't know. I guess I'll find out <laughs> someday. Um, I pay so Geico I think ten dollars a month for identity theft insurance. I'm sure they have me covered, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I signed up for like one of those at one point because Leslie and I like our credit card got stolen or something. Supposedly then... they cover your legal fees if you get hacked, but we'll find. Yeah. You, you don't want to find out that that doesn't work when it's actually happening. But I was uh, like. Do? As of like the last two years, I get all these random like 3 a.m. emails like your password was tried too many times. Like you may want to think about resetting it. I'm like, oh, that seems weird. (laughs) Guess I'll go on and Uh, add uh, another number. Like everything will be cool. (laughs) One. (laughs) Um, So I think that's pretty much the movie unless you have anything else you want to touch. I think I covered all of my my issues with it. It, it's, it's, it It was interesting. Uh, and funny. It was funny, yeah. like unintentionally, which I which is what I was hoping for. Um, so we'll get into the and I, I kind of gave you a heads up on this. The happily ever after. Who from this illustrious cast do you think you know? If you were gonna have to settle down in North Carolina or maybe move to New York, like who from this do you kind of pick up and and spend your days with? Easy for me. It is the producer lady that's working with the guy. Oh, she's yep, cute. Yep, yep. She's mousy. She's Where's... short. Very much my type. She seems like she's got it together. Mm-hmm. High powered New York job. Maybe I can go and just stay at home. I, I Lori. Think. Lori, you know? I think is her name. Yeah. Um, which is funny because I would go Brenda, which is the uh, <laughs> the producer for Kelly. Same reason. Like she seems to have an in with yeah, just yeah. everything in the city. She has no types. problem. Just Yeah. <laughs> like hanging out and just drinking wine. Like she's very relaxed at they're, any given the moment. Two of them yeah. are the coolest people in the whole movie. They're the most put oh, together. For sure. That's part of it. Yeah. There's, there is a 2024 movie where like those two end up together and like, that's the, <laughs> the side, you know, um, into it in the new day of Hallmark. I do. I talk about this a lot. I would love the idea of like just one movie like this, then spawning like this whole tree of like, other movies right like then we get brenda's side quest yeah right? like, like give me give go? me like give me like the white lotus of yeah. hallmark movies where we do a sequel and there's new characters but also there's like a couple of old ones and like what are yeah. they up to like brenda goes back to her hometown and then finds that could her be ex and like brilliant and, and then people from that like kind of it could yeah. be this whole or maybe that is what's happening. Maybe, and I just don't know. Like the first Hallmark movie has literally like just spawned them all. Somehow. They're missing an like, opportunity for sure. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm. It's on already board. all dumb. Why not make it weird too? 
<laughs> give, so, people, give people some mythos to dive into. People love that shit. Um, so I think I know the answer, but thumbs up, thumbs down for the secret ingredient. How do I yeah. even, I mean, yeah. I'm more curious in yours. I mean, I would say thumbs down, yep. but I don't like these movies. So, so I'm curious what you think. I would go thumbs down as too. A, as a uh, connoisseur. And and for the reasons I kind of mentioned up front, like it's very cookie cutter, but it even it's really it boils down to the two main characters. And you're right, like Andrew does not have a ton of personality. Like at no point do I really feel like they really love each other. Like it just, I have no investment in wanting to see them bang, yeah. which is really where the juice comes from in these movies. Like <laughs> literally you want to see these hot people mash their faces together. And it's like, eh, I mean, I don't think they want to even. So no, exactly. Um outside of that. There is a bunch of really weird shots. Um, and I'm thinking specifically like all the way back at the beginning when Andrew's first coming into town and his mom picks him up. And like they're sitting in the front seat, Andrew and his mom. And the camera person must have literally been like in between them and just like turning because the camera is so close to their faces. Like <laughs> there was no kind of thought behind like how we're going to film this. And you I don't know. Tibor was phoning in that day. Yeah. Is what you're saying? <laughs> it's weird because and i i i need to kind of reiterate that i do love these movies and i think a lot of them are great and i think in the last two or three years specifically they've branched out from this sort of format where we got in this and when i saw that this is what we were getting into with this one i was kind of bummed because it's like oh like this is eric's first time watching one of these like he's really getting like the cookie cutter and not particularly a great one right? it was kind like, of perfect honestly yeah like, start me off at zero so i know what like, give me the baseline and I guess it is, yeah. Only up from here. Um, so yeah, thumbs down for me too, unfortunately. Um, so that is the secret ingredient. Um, smalltownfailingpodcast.com. You can find everything, back episodes, YouTube, the cameos, uh, all that sort of fun, the socials, um, anything you need there. Uh, Instagram specifically, we post up. You can send in questions. We got a few this week and then we'll get to our our the question from our last episode first one there's no real answer here why don't you ever answer my questions um from one of our <laughs> listeners which is funny because yeah, and i my answer is ask better questions usually exactly like i i get a handful it's of good. ones and and i remember this and i'll fully admit like i stole this sort of send in your questions from bloody good horror when we were doing it mm -hmm. and it was rare know. that we didn't answer one but there were certain ones where it was just like this is stupid and like borderline offensive. So like sometimes they're not even questions. Yeah. Like, like what am I supposed to say to like, it's a game of yes. And you got to set me up here to. Yeah. Give an like answer. asking about pubes. It's like, okay, like, <laughs> I get it. Good for you. Um, next one was the secret ingredient love all along. Um, I would I say no. Yeah. <laughs> no, like was on a, cur a curve ball for this movie. No, there wasn't the much love ingredient involved. Yeah, the secret ingredient was emotional unavailability. <laughs> the secret ingredient was settling. <laughs> um, <laughs> which actually, now that I think about it, maybe Andrew's motivation was like tax breaks um, or like something <laughs> along those lines. Like, I'm making this big investment. I'm going to buy this restaurant. I don't know what sort of, you know, the taxes around um, owning a restaurant are, but like maybe being married gets him some sort of cut. <laughs> right. I don't know. Um, and then last one. Is a cookie cake for a 50 year anniversary a shitty gift? Um, kind of, right? So, as a gift, yes. At the yeah. party, everybody loves a cookie cake. Yeah. Well, I will say, 50, the, the first competition, everyone had a theme in this movie. And the first one was like, make a cake for a 50th anniversary. Oh, and that's it was, really funny. I didn't even catch that, that she made a cookie cake for the 50th. It was, so it was one of those, um, you that's see them a lot like, now. It's a here's cake. Your ice cream cake. Yeah, like from, from uh, here's a fucking, yeah, here's your cookie puss. Happy cookie 50th puss. anniversary. It's it's one of those cake well. in like the shape of numbers, which, you know, great for like a birthday or something, you know, at 21. But it was for like a 50 year anniversary. And I'm like, it did I'm say 5 0. It was fancy though. Like, it, oh, by the way, is it macaron? She I always thought it was macaroon. I think it might be macaron. Like, I don't know. Yeah, probably. I, maybe that's closer to the French, but just without the Maybe. Accent. You know what was concerning, though, was um, 
in the bakery as the the person working there they, we have these scenes where this woman comes in and she doesn't want to try anything new she keeps getting the same macarons the woman yes. working there would put like two or three in this gigantic box, like the size of like a medium or large size cake. Such a waste. <laughs> and then hand it to her. Like these <laughs> things aren't rattling around, like being destroyed. That woman, um, I forgot about her. But uh, I don't remember where the hell I was going. But but yeah, I don't know. I think if it was my 50th anniversary, I would want maybe a, a little more, you know, than like a, a cookie. Like. <laughs> They showed her baking this thing, and I saw the two like in the oven. I'm like, is she making fucking cookies for these people? I don't know, Joe. She Um, did put gold flakes on it at the end. That's true. And she won too. She won that competition or like that set. So I don't know. Maybe that is the right thing. Um, All right. So that's it for Instagram questions. One more, and I explained this to you before we hopped on. But my my Rachel Ray question from. Our last episode, a Scottish love scheme with one Mr. Andy Helmkemp, who you are love Andy intimately familiar another, with. Another former BGH that has since yeah. moved on. Um, so his question was, what is something on your list for 2024? And oh, sorry, what is something on your in list for 2024 and something on your out list? Um, which I didn't did you know this was a thing? Apparently, there's uh this whole, I don't know if it's TikTok or what, like there's an in and out list. So like, if I remember right, Andy's is like, I'm out with like anxiety or something or like yeah, yeah, yeah. Fucking bowling and then in with like meeting new people or yeah. I didn't realize it was a thing. No, you gave me a warning. So I wrote stuff down because otherwise I would have yeah. just been staring at you dead eyed. Um, <laughs> I'm very, I'm sure you remember this about me, but like I have health, I have autoimmune issues. Yeah. And like, I'm just a fucking wreck all the time. But I, I've spent the last few years really trying to hone in on like self-care and wellness. Mm -hmm. I'm down all those YouTube rabbit holes. So currently very in for me, the sauna. Oh, all Um, right. It is supposed to have really amazing health benefits like cardiovascular inflammation, depression helps with sleep. Like they do these studies for people who live in like Scandinavian countries that where this is just part of the culture. And Uh apparently they're all like doing great. Interesting. Uh, I just go down to the why though you, the, your childhood, why probably Joe? Oh um, yeah, yeah, sure. The one on, looks uh, exactly sw- the same swagger town or whatever. If I remember uh, right. drums, drums. Right yeah. Now. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I just go down there. I did last night feeling great today. I Very did not expect summer. that to be your in or, Oh yeah. That's and, a- uh, out for me getting up early. Cause I, as oh. we we're discussing before the show, I I've been fully remote for, there was a little period there at my previous job where they were trying to get me back in the office, but like pretty much been fully remote for like three, four years now. Mm-hmm. And I don't work till nine. And I've comp- now sometimes I have my kids, in which case I can get up at 6 a.m. But when I don't have them, I mean, I might get up yeah. at 40 to wow. get to work at nine. Yeah, which isn't great. You don't start the day feeling <laughs> like really ready to go, but it's just hard. It's but hard. You get like, there. Yeah. Yeah, but I, you know, it's nice to be able to sleep in a little bit. That's funny. I've made a conscious effort to like get up earlier, actually, because like the kids, that's like my alone time. Like, you have them all the time. Like I'm 50 50. So, like, yeah. I get, yeah, 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 for sure. That's the only time you get that's quiet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my, so I, I forget what my answer was with Andy, but I've changed it since thinking more about it. My in would be, or it's the same. Like I, this year I've wanted to make a conscious effort to go see more live music. Cause it's something I used to love and I just don't do it as much. Yeah, My out though me. is just trying, just trying to like make connections. And what, <laughs> <laughs> what I mean by that is this is by no means like a knock to anyone, but like I live in the suburbs and I have spent the last sort of eight or nine years here, like really trying to like like worm my way into like friendships with a lot of people Mm. around here and they're great guys and I love them and they're super friendly and have been nothing but nice to me, but we just do not have similar interests. Right. And I kind of had this, the internet's good for, right? Like finding the people you actually vibe with. And I've had such anxiety of like, I don't have any friends here. Like my neighbor and I were great friends. I get along with him and, you know, I try and sort of interact with a lot of the other folks around here. And it's just like, football and like the kids sports and like nothing that I, I have no problem with that being their thing, but like, I just don't, I don't, I know nothing about it. I can't add anything. So I just end up standing there 
like saying nothing and then start getting like anxious that like they just think I'm some asshole that, you know, doesn't want to interact with. I really feel that making friends as an adult is really hard. I was, it's funny you mentioned football. Like I was lucky in that, like I grew up watching a ton of sports and a lot of football. So I know the game, but I don't really follow it now, but I can pretend like I can bullshit with the best of them. I can be like, yeah, fucking first down, dude. I can uh, bullshit to an extent, but when you're in a group of like seven other guys that yeah, are no. one are talking about just the bears and like an area that I didn't even live in. So I don't even know any of the names they're like the Giants. And then start getting down into more like local, like, Oh, remember, you know, this coach from this. And I'm just like, I got yeah. nothing. And that's hard. Like, yeah. so I'm back, I live at home, my hometown now. So like I have friends here from high school that are all still here. Yeah. So I have like sort of people hang out with in real life. And then I do the same, like the internet is where I find the weirdos that I actually kind mm-hmm. of vibe with. Yeah. And so I've just kind of, and it was with my therapist, like a week ago after I kind of had this breakdown, just like, you know what? I just kind of like sitting here reading. So like, why don't I just do that? Like, is it, do I need to be out? You know, I'll still go out, I'll interact, but like, I don't need to force myself to like, be in because I'm just never going to be. And there's, it's just making things worse. And, and then like, I, yeah, it'll happen if it's meant to, like you, if you, yeah. if you're meant to run into some, somebody that is a good friend, you'll know, you'll yeah. know, you won't have to force it. You know, our, there's a bar in our little downtown that this year is doing, um, Tuesday night viewing parties for Vanderpump rules. Uh, so I feel like Leslie and I are real excited that like, maybe that's, that's where we'll meet our people. But well, that's my we'll problem is like, um, I don't drink. I don't yeah. really eat. Can't eat out that much. I don't stay up late. So like, what? Are, so if you we do start becoming friends, go, yeah. you're going to be like, "What do you want to do?" You're like, uh, "I don't know. I can't answer that question." That's the funny tonight. I'm actually going. Um, you you've met our friends up in uh, Milwaukee. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. We had a bloody good horror meetup there. Uh, the friendliest I'm, people you'll ever meet. Amazing. Yeah. So Ed is um the the husband in that couple we're getting together tonight just to go kenosha just literally to like go out for drinks and stuff and then we're gonna stay the night the the kenosha kickers yeah Yeah. john candy (laughs) actually do you know not to completely sidebar i live (laughs) i live about 40 minutes from woodstock illinois which is where they filmed groundhog day Um, oh yeah which is like they have like you know, a huge thing there. Actually, today is Groundhog Day. There's like a huge festival going on there. I worked with at my last Boston job a reporter who was a child actor and is the kid that fell out falls out of the tree that Bill Murray catches. Oh shit. There you John go. John something it was his name. He's a reporter in Boston now. That's funny. My one claim to fame is um the little girl from One Crazy Summer was my boss. The one with at- the f- making the face who gets the face. Stuck. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> No, the one that has the dog from Mars, the one that yeah. actually slaps the girls on the, the dog back. With the cone. And, yeah. Um, she was my boss. The last time I used to be a project manager in a former life and I was not good at it. She was my last boss that fired I me. Fucking, um, oh, she fired you. Damn. Yeah. yeah. I fucking love that movie. It's really fun. It's great. Um, Demi Moore, John Cusack, so it's great, Bobcat yeah. Goldthwick. Yeah. Um, Bobcat. where the hell was I going with this? Um, Oh, so anyway, we're going to Kenosha and (laughs) we've, we've been talking about this, like, oh, let's get together, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, in January, Leslie and I were trying to just like detox from all the awful things we ate during uh, December and then decided to like not drink for January either. Um, Not specifically for like a dry January, more to just kind of reset. And we were taught, Ed and I were talking about getting together and I'm like, well, I'm not eating and I'm not drinking. So like, I don't know what we're going to do if we get together in January. He's like, oh, well, we can get together and do something non-drinking. I'm like, but what? Like, what do you do? <laughs> like, Are you not drinking? I wasn't for That's January. Fine. Oh, and you were drinking by January. Yeah, yeah. In general, I've cut down a ton. Like I'll have a little bit on the weekends, but it's not like, I mean, on the show, right? I had the whole beer thing and all that. Yeah. And like, it just, you know, it uh, catches, catches up, up with, with you. you when, when it's the, the lifestyle. It catches up. Exactly. Yeah. I haven't had a drink um, since July of 2020. Wow. Which I was not a big drinker and a lot of it's just like, yeah, it caused me health problems, but yeah, like I, I don't really, I don't miss it that much. No. And honestly, like there's been times where I've thought, I mean, I still partake in the, uh, the marijuana a good amount. Um, oh, yeah. you know, that's the only way I sleep, but I'm, I'm CBD to the gills every day, pretty much. Mm-hmm. 
Well, it's not. It's legal in New York now, right? But it is, there's probably yeah. not much in upstate. Or they have not. There is one dispensary in Schenectady, mm-hmm. and the next closest one is in Lee, Massachusetts, right over the border. Oh, so there's God. not because it's New York, of course. So they're dragging their feet on licensing. Yep. So there's just not a lot. But it's what's nice. funny? What's funny is you probably haven't been to the city a lot, but I did the marathon last year, and Leslie and I were in town, and. We looked up where dispensaries were, and there was only like two in the city. So we're like, oh, fuck. Uh, but we got there, and every corner bodega that was selling like vape products or just alcohol has converted to a dispensary. And they're mm-hmm. not legal. They're not mandated. So God knows what you're actually getting in there. But they're so oh, overwhelmed, I guess, that they're not shit. cracking down on any of them. So like literally, you can just walk into a store. And buy like some of them are like security up the wazoo, but then we went into one. There was literally like the doors open and we just walked in. Like there's no, um, so until they crack down on those, it's just like free reign. Um, but where the hell was it going? Okay, so the ins and outs, Eric. I kind of gave you a heads up. I don't know if you had time to think about it, but I don't know who our next guest is going to be, and that's gonna you know kind of the fun of it. But a question for them, like what do you got? What's what's I got it. So I would like to know what their favorite guilty mm-hmm. pleasure like teen drama is oh from the the 90s or the like early 2000s guilty pleasure teen drama so mine what is yeah. easy dawson's creek i was, fucking love dawson's creek leslie and i talk about that a lot like i never watched any of them i never watched dawson's creek i never watched uh that was Melrose the only one Place i, I, or Beverly I Hills. had a girlfriend in 11th grade and she was like i remember hanging out with her one night and she's like oh dawson's creek is coming on do you want to watch it and i was like too cool you know like i'm a yeah. dude i'm like oh. by the end of the episode i was like so invested i was like oh. i can't believe she did that to him and then literally i don't even remember what happened to that relationship but I, then i was like uh, i watched every episode from the until that series was over isn't it weird and you know we were older when dawson creek was on i think i was actually in college but like the shows we watched as a kid like i watched er and when er <laughs> came out like i was Dude, Probably 12. Like, when I was 12, 11, 12, my favorite show was Cheers. Exactly. And I would watch it in syndication every night for like an hour. Like, I know I used Cheers. to watch MASH. Like, MASH. I was like a preteen watching MASH. And like, it seems <laughs> insane. Like, Moonlighting, like Remington Steel, like all these weird shows that like I would never picture. Like, Mia, my eldest, is 12 now because kids never, now yeah. we watch that shit because it was all you it was had the only thing right whereas yeah. now kids can just watch content just for kids all the time i have this theory mm-hmm. that it's like one rung on the way to idiocracy because mm-hmm. we sort of were forced to watch adult stuff because that was all there was and so adult stuff is sort of like you don't understand it but you're trying to it's like um aspirational yeah really, right like it matures you in a way mm-hmm. whereas you could be a kid and just watch fucking Coco Melon every day for the first six years of your yeah. life and have your brain be completely smooth by the time you become an adult. Like, yeah, who knows? So I wonder I what, mean, how that's going to play out. It, it It's interesting, right? Like it's good and bad. Because it's socializing to watch stuff because mm-hmm. you see how people act and like. You learn about know, murder. How good like, socializing cheers was for me, but. Yeah, exactly. Like you learn about alcoholism at the age <laughs> of 11. Like, like it's funny and cute to be an alcoholic who never goes home. But I, t- I don't think I had one, honestly. Like, like I said, like I would watch like ER and that sort of thing, but I never got into like the Melrose places or or any of that those. That was the only one. And then like, um, I've had people share their favorites with me. So I've seen some of like the OC, which is real wild. And I've seen oh, I did watch a good that, amount of Felicity, like, yeah. which I actually kind of liked. Like Felicity oh. pretty good. Um, but yeah, that was my one. The OC we did watch. So I guess that could be mine. Like I watched I the, count, at least I the first that, two yeah. seasons. I would say I was probably in my late twenties when it came out though. So I don't know if that is uh <laughs> And I've seen one episode of One Tree Hill, which is batshit crazy. That I never watched. But that guy well, ended like, up getting like it's charged, a huge leap. right? I don't think it's a huge leap between those kind of shows and all of those reality shows that you like. Like it's a similar oh. I think kind of guilty pleasure vibe. There. Well, that's as you were telling the story about how you started watching um whatever the hell one you said was yours uh dawson's creek dawson's creek yeah you know you just kind of watch it but it's same thing like leslie used to be you know back when you had like a full station for a computer that sat in your living room i would be on that and she would be watching the housewives behind me 
And then eventually I'm just like listening and like hearing these. And then eventually you're on the couch yeah. watching and then it's all down. I have actually there. watched a good amount of Vanderpump Rules. I've oh. not, not fully caught up, but I've seen a lot of it. Was that because of Scandaval or was it just? To, um, to... No, I was watching with Elizabeth because she was really into it. And oh, like, there you go. Thing. I started watching. It's like, that's a real hate watch for me because I fucking hate mm. all of those people. Like They're awful, awful human beings. That that Tom dude in particular, he's like a five-year-old. He has like the, ment- the mental ca- capabilities of a five-year-old and I can't look away. Like, it's Are we so talking weird. about dopey Tom or Scandaval. douchey Tom? Well, yeah, dope, it, the other one too is like, they're both children. Like, and I yeah. get that. Oh, hundred percent with them, but but I get the appeal. Like, it's 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 pure junk food, but it's pretty entertaining. It was. I would say when we started watching that, it was more of a I can't believe what these people are doing, and now it is definitely like a hate watch. Like this new season that just premiered, and if you're not up to date, like you obviously I know, know about, about the, whole the breakup and all that. I, oh, I know. I'm of the internet. Literally every person on that show has made it about themselves now. Like Sheena had like a mental breakdown supposedly because she started thinking, well, if this can happen to them, what about me? And like Lala's made it about like (laughs) every single person has had like some sort of traumatic experience. I'll tell you another thing I appreciate about that show is like whenever they're do they're doing their confessionals, they're like, Can you put on a dress that shows as much as your of your boobs as humanly possible on television? hundred percent. Yeah. Um it's smart. Eric, it works. Thank you so much for coming on and doing this. Uh, I appreciate yeah, it. I'm very excited about the reunion. Um, again, smalltownfailingpodcast.com is where you can get everything. iTunes, Spotify reviews, huge help. Thank you. Uh, smalltownfailingpodcast at gmail.com if you want to send in a long form. Eric, where can everyone find Bloody Good Horror? And then we didn't even talk about Hi Fi, right? It's Hi Fi. I'm doing that. I am. So- um, and then all your wares. We are so if you follow me, I'm Eric BGH on Instagram. Um, if you search just bloody good horror on wherever you listen to podcasts, you'll find us. Show comes out weekly. And then yeah, I make music. It's like um, oh, really quick, because I gotta go too, but I know you're yeah. rap. Um, so I make high I make I guess what I would call it synth wave. It's kind of morphed into its own thing, but that my influences it's a lot of like John Carpenter, uh 80s horror soundtracks, but like a little more modern sounding. Um so that's under hi-fi hy dash fy um I'm mostly on spotify but i'm also on Bandcamp. but i just told this anecdote to caitlin on her podcast plug it up a couple weeks ago but you uh, you probably don't remember this but you when i started making music gave me what to this day remains oh the biggest compliment and the biggest insult i've ever received on my music <laughs> which was I like did a lot of this so i taught myself how to make music at like 38 like i'd always mm-hmm. wanted to do it and i'm like finally one day i just sat down with an ipad and garage band i started tooling around it took me a year to kind of get the basics and then i spent six months working on an ep like four or five tracks i was so proud of it and i sent it to you and john this was like in the pandemic like first few months of quarantine and you wrote back do you remember this I don't. You wrote back, I figured, you wrote back, uh, I'm not trying to be a dick. Did somebody help you with this? <laughs> I No, I don't remember that at all. I was and expecting- I remember being yeah. so insulted, but also like, that's such a good compliment. <laughs> that's amazing. I My assumption was, and this is, I, I, I guess it is kind of a compliment. Well, no, no, no. Sorry, maybe it's it's a hundred percent a compliment, and but it can be taken the wrong way. No, I know, is, but just I, in such you, a Joe way. <laughs> no, I mean this. My assumption was I said something along the lines like, "This is not my usual type of music," but it is. Like all kidding aside, it's very good. Like even when you know we weren't talking much, I would still pop it on every once in a while. It's great, sort of like background stuff too when you're working, and then also just has like you can listen to it when you're like on a jog too and things like that. Like it is, it's very good. Like. And, the, I, I you know, that. did someone help you with this is <laughs> it reminds me of and I know we got a wrap, so I'll, I'll do this quickly. Yeah, yeah. I remember my buddy Pat when we were in high school. He started fiddling around with the guitar and we were all just like, Jesus Christ, stop. And then he kind of <laughs> disappeared with it for like six months and then did like a yeah, talent show at the school on it. Yeah. and then came back and we we're just like, holy <laughs> fuck, like he's. Ama- like he was doing the first time we heard him do was a cover of um white room that cream song and like the guitar in that is just like all these fucking crazy things and he like nailed it and we we're like oh my god like what the hell happened here 
it was very much like that. Like we didn't even know you were doing this. And then all of a sudden it just sort of popped up and it's like, holy shit, like this sounds legit. Like, which I think was my kind of <laughs> dickhead comment, but in that sort of vein. Yeah. Nice. Uh, no, I, I appreciate that. So if people want to listen to it, it's H Y dash F Y high fi. Uh, yeah. Nice. Check and well, I'll put links to everything in there, but Eric, thank you again. Uh, I don't know <laughs> what we're doing next time, but we'll figure it out. And uh, yeah, I think that'll do it. Thanks everybody. Bye. Bye.